G'day, welcome to the Noob Spiro Podcast. I'm one of your co-hosts, Shrek, and uh, unfortunately not joined by Turbo today. He's still hoeing into his renovation. He could be back at some stage in the future, but anyway, this is the Noob Spiro Podcast, the place to catch up on some spearfishing news, just get some stoke back in you, in you if you've been spending too long out of the water, maybe even learn a thing or two and improve your spearfishing. Today's interview is... It's good for that. We're going to Norway to talk to Gil and Ole uh, from Arctic Spearfishing there in Norway. They chase those big halibut that you've seen guys like Daniel Mann chasing. And uh, we learn all about spearfishing in Norway today, Arctic Spearfishing galore. If you want to follow the, these guys, they are on Facebook and Instagram as Arctic Spearfishing. I'd encourage you to do so. Uh, so all things Norway and all things Norway spearfishing today. I uh, just want to say a quick thanks to Rachel from the Brisbane Bull Sharks for recommending these guys. She is right. They are an absolute pair of characters, and uh, it's one cracker of an interview. So I look forward to that sharing with you in just I look forward to sharing that with you in just two shakes of a lamb's tail. Uh, good joke there for some of my Aussie buddies. All right, a um, couple of shout-outs before that, though. Uh, Sebastian was listening to episode 93. Uh, Tom Blanford talking about squeaky fins, and Tom mistakenly recommended WD-40, um, but Tom even knew that. He messaged me after and he said, uh, use silicon because it'll damage the plastic and rubber. So I just wanted to chuck that in there. Thanks for Sebastian for um, pointing that out, mate. Always welcome. Uh, Dallas Davies from Newcastle Neptune's Underwater Club is seeking sponsors for the 60th Australian Pacific Coast Spearfishing Championships. Now, um, <clears throat> this year it's held in Nelson Bay from the 19th to the 21st of April 2019. This is one cool comp because all of the fish captured uh, are auctioned off daily in aid of the Westpac Rescue Helicopter Service. Now, these guys pluck watermen out and rescue them all up and down uh, the east coast of Australia. Uh, absolute mad effort to get behind and uh, like the idea of these um, fish being auctioned off in support of, of them. So check out the uh, the Newcastle Neptune's Underwater Club Facebook page and uh, get some more details for that comp from the 19th to the 21st of April. Uh, Freediving Dan. Uh, I'm pretty sure Dan Silvier is an unusual character. He's uh, often on Instagram. And uh, I really like this quote from him today. You can fo follow him at Instagram at Freediving Dan. But I really like this. He wrote, as a, as a hunter, we quickly begin to learn the cycles in life. The first one we learn is that some days are great, but most are not. Therefore, we have to learn to appreciate the little moments in life so we can make it to the next moment of good fortune. We also learn how to cook because after our good fortune, we eat like kings. But most of the time we eat like a peasant and we rely on those good cooking skills to be creative. The second lesson we learn is clarity. Often the hunt is dangerous and requires complete focus. Our body purges out everything that does not belong in our mind and body. The beginning is difficult, but once the body and mind are free and clear, then the real magic begins. The energy in our body realigns with everything else on earth as it has for thousands of years before us. It's simply part of the chain of life. The third lesson is that there will always be wolves trying to steal from us, meaning there will always be bad people and those that say bad things. Don't worry about them. They are from a different clan and they cannot change their ways. Just don't let them take you down. Really like this uh, bit of poetry from Freediving Dan on Instagram. Check him out and follow him. Magic. Um, in other news, I got a, a cool message from Alex Hamilton from the Central Coast Sea Lions. They've got a mad freediving club down there. There's about 30 or 40 active members that meet uh, on the fourth Thursday of every month at 7.30 p.m. The Breakers Country Club in Wamborough. Um, follow them on Facebook, Central Coast Sea Lions. They're a really cool club and uh, really good to sort of hear a little bit about how they're going. And, um, and uh, they've had some success um, dealing with this marine parks issue, but it's not over yet. So keep your heads up, guys, and uh, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, love to love to see the progress. Uh, it's good to see Spiros United and uh, doing stuff together. So cool. Hey, um, also noticed a whole bunch of guys are listening to the podcast through YouTube, and it's cool. We've got a whole lot of subscribers on there now, and and that's great. But obviously, a, a lot of the time we don't post many videos on YouTube. It's just the audio. So I just wanted to tell you guys, you can um, get a podcast app on your phone. Um, Spotify is really popular and there's the native uh, 
the podcast app that comes in iOS phones and also on Android. It's okay. Uh, personally, I use the Castro app. I really like it for listening. But other other apps that are popular with our listeners include CastBox, Google Podcasts, and Podcast Addict. So any of those apps are really good for listening to um, the show. And I'd just encourage you to subscribe and, as you as usual, you know, leave a review because um, it helps other people find the show. So that would be fantastic. And um, I never, oh, just another quick tip while we're there. I never listen to interviews on standard playback speed. You can boost the speed. So I'll listen on double double speed most of the time now. It takes a little bit of getting used to, but I, I, I think I personally sound heaps better. But anyway, hey, um, that's, that's all the shout-outs for today. I just wanted to thank you guys for all the love on social lately. You can always follow Noob Sparrow Podcast on Instagram or Facebook and uh, catch up with us there. Join the private group there on Facebook as well and and come in and you can make some noise and uh, ask any questions you might have. But hey, let's get into this interview with Gil and Ole from Arctic Spearfishing. Adreno Spearfishing are today's proud sponsor of the Noob Spiro podcast. They stock a huge range of equipment that you can find in Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne and now Perth. That's right, spearfishing.com.au have got a huge range of gear. I encourage you to get along, use the code Noob Spiro, N-O-O-B-S-P-E-A-R-O and save yourself $20 on every purchase over $200 when you shop online. G'day Noobers, today I'm joined by Ole and Gil from Norway and uh, we've already been chatting and they thought the interview had started but uh, as usual I was just clumsy and disorganised but uh, welcome to the show guys. Uh, <laughs> can you, uh, Hello, thank can, you. Can, can, can you, uh, Hello, thank you, thank you mate. Can you introduce yourselves again? Well my name is Gil and I'm originally from Israel and I live in and. Um, I'm married to Ule, and we live together in Norway, in the north of Norway. Yeah, yeah. I'm. Uh, my name is Ule. I'm uh, from the south of Norway, but we live up here in the north now, uh, Arctic Norway in Tromsø. Ah, yeah. okay, cool, cool. All right, I've actually I've read a book by a person there, but it was a few years ago, so you're fully scratching my my knowledge here. But look, Rachel from the Brisbane Bull Sharks uh, introduced me to you guys. Uh, how do you guys know her? Oh, yeah. We met her in uh, Utila. So Utila is an island in Honduras, and uh, that's where we met. Uh, we were both working with scuba diving. This is me, me and Gil met there, but also uh, our common friend, yeah. Yes. Oh, wow. So, so we met there, uh, me and Ule, five years ago, and then we went back uh, three years ago, and that's where we met Rachel. Ah, cool. So you guys were scuba diving instructors in a former life as well. Yes, shout out to all the Scooby Doobies. <laughs> uh, there's, yeah. there's no shame in, in, air, in using tanks. <laughs> no, there well, is. Not, not with spear fishing, of course, no spear fishing. No, uh, Gil was, uh, Gil was the, the dive master, and I came in as a dive master in training. And... That's right. Oh, you were, you were pretending to need help, and Gil felt sorry for you, and that's how you guys hooked up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I played the pity card all the way. I'm still <laughs> using it. <laughs> That's How a, do I put on these fins? <laughs> <laughs> One uh, foot at a time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, I was a, a scuba, a bubble blowing uh, instructor in a former life as well. So it's funny. It's, it's, it's the it's the gateway drug to the freediving world, isn't it? It is. It is. Uh, I, I think it's a lot. It's a lot to do with you know passion for the ocean, and it starts with. Uh, Starts with just uh, swimming around or whatever, snorkeling, scuba, freediving. It's a natural, natural way of going about. Yeah, cool. All right, and uh, you guys do a lot of spearfishing there in Norway. Do you actually take other people out as well? Have you got some sort of operation there? Yeah, uh, we've uh, started doing that uh, this season. We, uh, uh, we we started just a couple of guys. Uh, it was uh, pretty cool because. Uh, a mate and mine, uh, Gil, we, when we started four years ago, we started a company, uh, or my mate started a company called Arctic Spearfishing. And uh, we started editing some videos that uh, got a lot of views. So uh, we also started using that to get some people coming to Norway and uh, going spearfishing with us. So we started taking people out and... Uh, this next season looks uh, to be booking up really fast. 
So, yeah. <laughs> There's been a couple of Aussies go over there and 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 shoot some big fish, and uh, you guys make some good videos as well. Your characters on camera, so I can see why it's got some appeal. And uh, the air, look, yeah, cheers. The air looks clean there. The water looks cold, but uh, but beautiful as well. <laughs> and. Uh, and the fish look um, excellent. When we get into the veterans' vault, I really want to dig right into nor- uh, nor- can I call it Nordic spearfishing? Uh, Arctic. 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 Arctic spearfishing. Yeah. What's so? What's Arctic Nordic then? It's not, it's not Norway. It's more uh, uh, Nordic is Nordic is for uh, a kind of similar. Uh... It's kind of a synonym for Scandinavia. So Nordic ah. would be. Denmark, Sweden, and Norway. Ah, uh, okay. But uh, but uh, spear fishing is essentially illegal in Sweden. Yeah. So I guess that's not Nordic spear fishing. <laughs> no, but, 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 it, but, it, but it is a Nordic spear fishing community, which is uh, a group uh, run by I think Matti Piccolo, the Finnish uh, spear fishing champion. Right, He's cool. a legend. Yes. Shout out. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, thanks for not making me feel silly there. So we'll go with Arctic spearfishing for the Veterans Vault. But um, look, tell us a little bit about like your background in the water. How, how did you get started? All I, um, how did you get started just in the water in general? Uh, well, I started just, uh, being really interested in the water from a very young age. I picking scallops and uh, no, actually mostly oysters. I was picking at a very early age. Um, Got out of pole spare when I was probably around 12. Wow. Uh, but it kind of stopped with that for a long while. And then I did uh, scuba diving. I, I actually got my open water, I think, maybe 12 years ago in, in uh, Australia. Okay. Uh, and then uh, when we went to Utila, I did more scuba diving. And then I also did a free diving course. Uh, which really int- made me interested in uh, spearfishing when I got back to Norway. Uh, I, I, I started out uh, with a, a good friend that also was part of uh, Arctic Spearfishing. We met up in a, a barbecue here in uh, Tromsø. And we both uh, recently done freediving courses and we both thought that this area would be really cool to start spearfishing. And uh, he had a a little bit experience with spearfishing, but nothing more than uh, poking a couple of flounders, stuff like that. Mm. So uh, we ended up uh, getting a flat together and uh, and then we just uh, went online and booked uh, full gear, ordered full gear. And yeah, that's... Uh, <laughs> yeah, what? and while they were doing that, I was the teaching... Uh, I also was there in the story. Yeah. And... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was doing, uh, I was still teaching uh, scuba diving. I was working as a scuba diving instructor. Yeah. And I was, uh, I was like the anti uh, spearfishing league. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, and then uh, after a while, I just uh, surrendered. You know, if you can't beat them, join them. <laughs> and. Uh- I thought you were going to tell me about some big moral moment when you actually realized it was it was okay, but there was none of that. It was no. just a, this gradual persuasion. It just wore you wore you down. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> That's we each have our weapons, you know, in any relationship. <laughs> yeah. We just wear each other down until there's nothing left, right, my love? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's uh, marriage for you. Iron sharpens yes, iron. But, uh, and then I surrendered to it. And then uh, also I just love to be in the water and dry suits are the worst. So I just uh, succumbed to it. And actually I love hunting as well. Okay, cool. So there is the joy of hunting, the joy of being in the water, and the joy of eating delicious fresh food. So mm. you can't really fight that. So when did your love start for the underwater world, Gil? Did I mean, did you did you grow up like in the water in Israel, or or was it something that you you got to later in life? Yeah, I mean, my earliest memories are being on the beach with uh, my family. So I've always loved the water. And then uh, the first time I went spear fishing was in Utila when we were, of course, hunting uh, lionfish, which is an invasive species. Yep, yep. Mm. So you got some good stories yeah. for that. Did you get stung? Did I get stuck? Did you get spiked? Stung. Did you get stung? spiked? Well, no, I, I have. A, I do have a funny story though. Okay. So there was this guy, this. Uh, okay, so there was a student, 
And uh, in all the briefings for the uh, dives, we would always tell the students, okay, and we have lionfish, and you would show the symbol for the lionfish, and you would say, this is a, an invasive species, and we really don't like it here, and that's why we hunt lionfish. And this guy was like uh, uh, this really large kind of ogre American guy. He was uh, <laughs> doing like his me. like... <laughs> <laughs> No, don't sell yourself short. Yeah. Anyway, so there was this large ogre American guy, and uh, they were down at like 15 meters, and the and the, the instructor was showing him the lionfish, and he punched it. He punched oh, the lionfish, oh, nice. and you know, it, yeah, and immediately, like uh, he he tried to. I mean, it immediately got swollen. And he tried to bolt to the surface and like the dive masters in training were holding him down. And uh, I don't know, I tried, I was working at the bar also later and I tried to sympathize with him, but he was just an idiot. So I got, I don't, I got no sympathy for that. Yeah, yeah. He was also a chauvinist. That's where I draw the line. Ah, okay. Yeah, remember this guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was an idiot, right? Okay. (laughs) <laughs> at least he wasn't a Spiro, though, so that's good. Because um, yeah. cause then it would have given us all a bad name, hopefully. He wasn't a Spiro, was Ho- he? No, hopefully he's landlocked now. No, he was doing it with his hands, punching fish. So. Punching fish. <laughs> it's a next level spare fishing. Oh, mm-hmm. jeepers, that's all kind of <laughs> stupid. Um, punching a lionfish. Yeah. Uh, where do you go with that? Yeah. Um, it, it would be very hard to have sympathy, um, especially after sort of briefing him on them. But uh, yeah, right. Um, what what kind of challenges did you guys face um, with spearfishing? I mean, you got cold water there. That's got to lend itself yeah. to a whole lot of challenges, I'd imagine. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, I did go spearfishing with uh, proper gear uh, once before I started freediving as well. I tried it in uh, Ecuador, which was uh, you know amazing, and I shot a parrotfish, and I was super super stoked and all that. So uh, that's how I kind of thought it would be really cool to do it in Tromsø. But in Ecuador, obviously, you just go with uh, board shorts and <laughs> you're good. <laughs> uh, here in Tromsø, uh, it was it, it was quite uh, difficult to get starting because we didn't uh, we, we we didn't have any uh, we didn't know anybody doing it. We didn't really have any mentors coming into the game, so it was just me and my mate, uh, and we just thought okay we need seven millimeter wetsuits luckily that was the suit that we needed and oh wow and then you try okay you need gloves what gloves do you get and then you get different five finger gloves and you get different socks and and the uh, gloves are not warm enough obviously and then you try different five finger gloves and they're not warm enough and then you try another pair <laughs> Until you realize that you need mittens, you know, three finger gloves, mm-hmm. and then it's all this, uh, just these adaptions on how to, how do you stay warm in the water, and, uh, and 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 then it was the fact of trying to find areas where it's fish, because you uh, there's uh, areas where you have a lot of uh, tidal currents up here, okay. where you have a lot of upwelling and fish aggregations. Uh, but uh, you really need to figure out how to dive these areas. You need to figure out, do you go before full tide before or, or after low tide or when do you go? And mm-hmm. We kind of had to figure out all these things on our own. Uh, I'm sure there, there are, would be people that we could contact and go through, but uh, this was about five years ago. And wasn't it wasn't that popular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it wasn't that popular up here. Uh, it developed immensely uh, in the country. It's almost a national sport these days. Yeah, yeah. Sure. But we would spend we would spend a lot of time walking. You know, we would try to figure out the current. We're like, oh, it's no problem. We'll start in here. We'll end up there. Uh, you know, and you start in here and you end up there, like all the way over there, and then you end up walking. So we yeah, did a lot of walking. Yeah, okay. At Could, the beginning, and we the transition to boats was yeah. difficult. I don't know why it was such a huge leap, but. Uh, yeah, yeah, it, it, it was. It, it it took quite uh, quite a few years before we realized uh, how good you go with a boat. How good it is to have a boat. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Short, short shore diving here is great. You can get a lot of fish, but with the with the currents, you know, you uh, end up having to walk a three kilometer hike back to the car. <laughs> 
after oh, wow. after a forty five minute drift. And you don't have the warm the warm water coming out the back of the outboard to put down your wetsuit. Uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, I've never done that actually. I saw a a video from Daniel Mann. Did he come over and dive with you guys? Yeah, it's uh, it's a uh, funny we we met him out on the ocean one day. We we were out spearfishing halibur, and uh, he was in the area. Uh, his second trip, he, uh, him and his crew, they came to Tromsø to the uh, to where we're going, and yeah, we just uh, said hi and we saw him oh, out there. Cool. Cool. Uh, we had one boat here. Yeah, <laughs> they they looked like ice pinnacles. <laughs> <laughs> he just he when you started talking about those gloves, I was just watching a video from him the other day because he had all these tips about how to stay warm and um in the water over there because he's yeah. got. He's got like a custom nine mil polo subsuit, I think, and um, so he's yeah, it's he's it's the, uh, we, we have we, some things to say about that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, all, all credit, all credit to him is an uh, absolute legend. Legend, but yes. uh, hello, <laughs> but, hello, Daniel, uh, man, we love you. But but uh, nine millimeter or eight and a half millimeter is uh, it's a bit redundant, I think. I, I got a Elias uh, seven mil, and that keeps me keeps me well and warm all yeah. year round. And uh, uh, also, uh, when you're out on the boat, it's uh, crucial that you have a, a coverall. You know, uh, like a padded coverall, like an overall. Okay, yeah. So you've got so a, you, another so, layer. Yeah. So yeah. So you always put that on. On top of your wetsuit. Oh, in between dives and. Uh, it, it's uh, day and night uh, having having a coverall uh, when you go up on the boat. Otherwise, you just get cold. And I don't know. I, I never tried the trick with putting warm water in my socks or in my uh, gloves. But it, it, if you have good socks and gloves, you your fingers really don't get cold before your before the rest of your body really. So. If okay. uh, what I do, I, I just never take my gloves off. Once you do, once because once your hands get cold, uh, it's just inevitable you will start freezing. Yeah. yeah and yeah. Uh, if uh, as an Israeli, so I come from a warm climate, the trick to living in Norway is wool. So when I go out, I have like the coverall protects from the wind. It keeps you warm, and then on top of my suit, I put like a woolen hat. And on top of my gloves, I put woolen gloves, and uh, I've even put on socks, woolen socks on top of booties. Okay. And uh, you have to have Crocs so that your feet aren't like on the aluminium <laughs> boat. Yep, yep. So, yeah. yeah. And every once in a while, you go in the water with your hat. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a win-win. <laughs> I was going to say to you, like Crocs are probably a necessity uh, where you are, but here they're more of a fashion accessory. Um, oh, really? uh, definitely <laughs> yeah, well, a clear yeah. winner. They're, they're, they're definitely a fashion accessory here yeah. as well, but, yeah. but they're, a, they're a necessary one. Yeah. Uh, I went through quite a few uh, socks before before I figured out I could get huge Crocs. Like Crocs. So before you ask Isaac, we do have matching yellow, bright neon yellow Crocs. <laughs> you guys are one of the yes. hottest couples in global spearfishing today. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, cool. All right, so that's overcoming the cold. I mean, before the show started with my really terrible introduction, you guys were giving me a great insight into some of the, the topography and the conditions and the weather you deal with there. So can you give me a, a bit of a rundown again on that? Because, um, I mean, I, like you were talking about current, and I think it's a good chance to give probably people a bit of an insight into why you deal with so much current. And I just, yeah. So tell us a little bit about, you know, what you're dealing with there. Yeah, so uh, so we live on an island, right? So it's uh, straits and fjords uh, all around us, and there are th there's uh, quite a tide difference up here. So with all that water mass being dragged through, uh, you, you get areas uh, in narrower straits. You get really really strong current. Uh, you ha you always have to uh, look at the tide schedule before you go spearfishing. If you miss it, you, know, you just uh, <laughs> you you spend half the day walking back. But it's uh, it's really good also for some some fish aggregation areas where you, where you have a lot of upwelling. You can get a lot of uh, 
a lot of different uh, di different species like cod and save and uh, yeah well I say a lot but <laughs> up in high latitudes you don't really have that species richness which you have uh, down in temperate waters but mm -hmm. but uh, at least there's <laughs> a couple of uh, Couple how, of pelagics. How many species? So it's a lot of fish. It's just not such a colorful variety. Yeah. yeah. Look, and I, I sometimes don't think that that, you know, it, it doesn't mean it's very good either. I mean, we talked to guys in Scotland before, and I think they're flat out shooting maybe three or four species like regularly. And uh, I mean, here off Brisbane was spoiled. I think there's more than forty. But uh, the, you know, the Kiwis, like the fur the further south you go in New Zealand, the the less species there are. And, um, you know, but, but the guys still love their spearfishing and I'm sure it's the same where you guys are. What are the main species you're shooting there apart from the big, the big halibut, obviously, that everyone yeah, loves? Yeah, ab absolutely. It's, uh, it, it, it's a really good spearfishing. You get, you get good uh, visibility. You get, you get decent temperatures in the summer. It's uh, 12, 12 degrees in the water or 8 to 12 degrees. So... Uh, it's mainly cod and uh, scythe, also called uh, coal fish, okay. uh, which are the which are the semi pelagic or they're they're mostly demersal, but they're pelagic hunters anyway. Okay. Uh, and uh, and, and then they there's school. yeah, and they school uh, okay. to some degree. So you can and, get into really big schools of scythes. Very. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. And uh, then it's uh, wolfish, which is very abundant up here in Tromsø. It's, uh, but, uh, I don't know if you know, it's, uh, they call it, uh, they have similar ones in the Pacific that are uh, wolf eels. Okay, yep. Uh, and yep. They're nasty looking fish, but, but they're really good eating. Uh, I think they're adorable. They, uh, <laughs> they are adorable. When we started out spearfishing, we would target them a lot, but they're quite territorial and they're not really hard to spearfish once you find some areas where they're abundant. Because... They, you, you can go down and you can start petting, pet them and you can uh, uh, yeah. pretty much weigh them uh, as they lay there and uh, they're, they're quite quite yeah, adorable. So we, don't, we, we take uh, one, <laughs> one or two every now and then just because they're really good eating. But yeah. that, 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 They're uh, like the seeing, the seeing eye dog of the Norway reef. Yeah. yeah. I, I kind of think of it like a cat. Like you can pet it and pet it and pet it and then all it all of a sudden it snaps on you. Yeah, yeah. Because ah, when, okay. when you do shoot them, uh, they. I don't think uh, you should keep this. Uh, they this, have uh, a jaw. <laughs> they have like, they're like an alligator. They have a jaw that's like fused with their skeleton. And when they lock on, they don't let go. Oh, wow. So, uh, so it's, uh, once you shoot it, you have to be very careful. Now that you've yeah, associated but, uh, them with cats, though, and they're able to defend themselves, I'd feel much better about shooting one straight away. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was getting at. We shouldn't keep this comparison going for too long. <laughs> <laughs> cat right, killer, cat killer. <laughs> yeah. So, so when you started no. spearfishing their gill, was that a species you, you did start targeting a lot? Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, the first species... Uh, was the f uh, my first species that I got was a flounder, okay, like red spotted flounder, and I didn't exactly spear it. I kind of just uh, <laughs> uh, I, I shish kebabed it. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, you don't yeah want... so I shish kebabed uh, a couple okay. on uh, on one dive, and I was very proud of myself. How, how did you and, spot them? Uh, are they are they easy to spot there? Well, you have to have a trained eye, Isaac. <laughs> okay, so how do you train your eye for them? No, no. <laughs> No, I mean, you know how it is when you work uh, underwater, then you, the you, you learn how to find things. So I have, it's just like, uh, I'm sure later we'll talk about uh, the halibut, but it's just like anything else. You have to train your eye to find something. So you never see it and you never see it and you go out and you can't find it. And then all of a sudden you find one and then you find all of them. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Do so, and then of course uh, the wolf fish. Yeah, I targeted wolf fish. And uh, they're, they are, uh, it's, it's really fun, I have to say, to shoot a wolfish, but uh, I, I don't do it anymore. I mean, we, we get a few for food. I mean, if we, have to, we have to eat, but, uh, but uh, I've moved on. And then uh, cod, uh, I used to uh, hunt cod, but now I've given up on cod because every time you take it out, it shits all over you. <laughs> I have oh, a special relationship with every fish. <laughs> <laughs> 
What, what, what about gutting them in the water? Do you, do you ever do that? What did you say? If you want. With the, with the cod, what about gutting them in the water before you, like, take them out? You know, like, just as soon as you get them up to the surface and you pull your shaft out and icky them, just gut, gut them and pull it all out while you're still in the water. Yeah, of course. It's yeah. a good. Uh, uh, we definitely should start doing it. I, I think uh, I do it every now and then, but it's uh, compared to where you where you are. I guess you do quite a bit of burling and stuff like that. Uh, in uh, in Norway, it's a little bit redundant to do burling because uh, at least here, because if you uh, start burling or chumming, uh, you'll just uh, feed the fish that's uh, 500 meters away from you at any given time, almost <laughs> with the current. Yeah, no, it's not always about it's not always about burly. Sometimes in Australia, a lot of the weed eating fish have got really like yeah. rancid smelling guts. Like what they eat by, oh, the time oh, yeah. it, by the time it goes through their digestive system. If you if you pop that guts when you're like on the boat or back at home. And pull out all that. Mm. Oh, it's just disgusting. Like, so I, yeah. I, I, oh I, t- I tend to always do it in the water. Um, and it's not just a burly yeah. thing. It's just a, like a, uh, so I can't yeah. be bothered. So I want yeah, to actually yeah. fill it when I get home and not stink my house out. But yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, I hate. Oh, but that just makes me think about cod. <laughs> 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 oh, you know how many times I've been shot on by cod. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's a good idea. We'll stick to that from here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, what we forgot the, to tell you about the things you learn on Noob Sparrow, eh? <laughs> <laughs> we forgot to tell you about scallops. Oh okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, that's true. True that. Scallops, um, uh, king crab. Oh yeah! Wow, they, uh, they grow really big there too. Is, yeah, yeah, huge. Yeah, um, king crabbing is a uh, really, really fun type of. Uh, well, it's not spear fishing; it's more knife crabbing. So mm-hmm. it's uh, about a seven-hour drive uh, northeast from here uh, towards the border of Russia. We have uh, a really abundant uh, king crab, which is an invasive species. So we we will go and just. We put like a snowboard or a ski box on top of the car and we fill it with ice and ice and crab and oh, wow. yeah, yeah, like uh, that, kilos and kilos. That we sounds a like a freezer. cool trip. Just going on a yeah, crab. It is, it's fantastic. It's, yeah, it's my favorite. Yeah, cool. And uh, and there's also an angler fish. Okay. It's uh, it's rare, but it's very good. Uh, like a monk monkfish. Monk Are they fish. almost like translucent? Um, like no, can... uh, not uh, well. The angler fish is uh, the deep sea ones. I guess they are, but the ones that come up in the shallows here in the summer are uh, uh, they're they're also called monkfish. It's uh, common further south as well, uh, but uh, they're really really good eating and uh, yeah, it's fantastic. And Ola has a secret monkfish recipe. Ooh. Which one? Oh, I, I had the liver. Yeah. The liver, monkfish liver. Monkfish liver, better than mm. foie gras. Yes, absolutely. Foie gras? Yeah, uh, goose or duck liver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you'll have so, to expand on that now. It's intriguing. <laughs> yeah, uh, so, uh, so the the monkfish, right, it has a quite big liver. And uh, I don't think uh, people u- use barely enough of the fish they catch, but... If they uh, ever come across a monkfish and it has a good-looking liver, fry that up and do some salt and pepper. It's absolutely yeah. delicious. So Ola just sears it on the outside. Yeah. Basically, and then you can eat it just like you would eat like a duck liver or whatever liver you like to eat. I don't know if people eat liver in Australia. Yeah, they do. Like uh, it's more of a, like a an old school recipe. There are several going, but I haven't really done it with. I mean, I guess it's a cold water fish sort of type recipe that, that people do and I haven't done a lot of it recently so I'm not really familiar with it. So that sounds pretty cool. So just sear it and salt and pepper, done. Yeah, done, done. And it's, uh, isn't it two-thirds of the body because it uses no, to no. regulate uh, its its No, uh, no. I'm making it up. Yeah. So the, 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 <laughs> the head is two-thirds of the weight. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, you can uh, edit it later. <laughs> no, no. 
I like some stuff in here that's not completely true. That way, our audience will have to <laughs> sift through it because oh. half, half of the well, stuff I mumble. Uh, the, the liver is. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, cool. Um, what's one of the best maybe stalks you've had on a fish, Ollie? I mean, over there you're probably dealing with a lot of more ambush type type fish, yeah. like halibut and flounder. I mean, do you have like a really clever fish that's difficult to hunt? So, uh, so some of them. Uh... The pelagic a little bit further south, uh, they have a pollock. It's a fish that you really have to do stalking or waiting for. Uh, I had some good stalks on pollock in the south, but nothing uh, too noteworthy. Because uh, uh, here, here also uh, you do stalking for cod, but they're a little bit easier to uh, to uh, get to come to you. They're, they're a little bit more curious, not so smart. If you call it smart, <laughs> but but uh, it's it's mostly uh, mostly ambush and uh, and uh, search and search and search and search and find when it comes to halibut. Search and dive bomb. So we had um, yeah. so you had the scallops and the king crab. What other um, what other food do you guys harvest from the ocean? Do you do you guys eat seaweed and or or kelp? Uh, yeah, we, we tried a little bit. Uh, there are some, uh, some seaweeds that are better than others. My, my mate recently uh, found out about this uh, kelp that's called a uh, truffle kelp. Okay. And uh, he, he took me out. We were out spearfishing uh, for halibut. And it was at the end of this season and he, he uh, found some that he thought was uh, truffle kelp and he, he gave it to me. He's like, ah... Oh, He's a uh, Belgian, so he got a bit of an accent. He's like, ah, you have to try this. It's very, very nice. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, uh, this is truffle kelp. Uh, oh, wow, yeah, it sounds cool. We were in the water. I took it. I started <laughs> chewing it, and it wasn't truffle kelp. It was just the most bitter and nastiest <laughs> thing I ever tasted. <laughs> uh, like you, your Belgian guy, he sounded remarkably French, but... Um, but... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they speak French. <laughs> yeah, they... there's like a French-speaking part and a Flemish-speaking part in Belgium. Ah, so you were the doing the, the French-speaking part, cool. I yeah. guess so, yeah, yeah. yeah. But he really sounds like this all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and he uh, can convince you to eat very strange things. Yeah, absolutely. All right, did we miss any other species or weird stuff you guys like to eat in the ocean? <laughs> uh, we, we used to eat, uh, we ate some snails. We yeah. used to, there was a time we would eat snails. Yeah. And, uh, sea then, snails. Um, like abalone yeah, or sea like sn- proper sea snails, like big, ugly ones? Yeah, uh, no, just uh, the, the small ones uh, okay. that you find on the shoreline. Yeah. Um, we, also mussels from time to time. Yeah, yeah occasionally we eat blue mussels, but it can be poisonous here. Okay. Uh, so you have to check very well with the... What, what there, there's online? like a forecast uh, yeah. online that, where they do uh, algae samples and they check for different algae poisons. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. yeah. It, and wait, there was one thing that I'm forgetting. Okay, but we said angler. But what's the, the last one? Ah, uh, l- lump sucker, yeah. Yes, lump sucker. Oh, lump sucker is amazing. Okay. You know lump sucker? No, no idea. <laughs> so. It, it, it looks I, it looks like a, like a like someone inflated a balloon and then drew eyes on it. Kind of like a puffed up puffer fish. Yeah, but like it had like a puffer fish had a baby with a frog fish. <laughs> and a dinosaur. Yes, and the dinosaur. Uh, you guys are. It's very like if they all if they all had a gangbang and they <laughs> squirt out this thing that looked like a balloon. <laughs> And uh, uh, it's called a lump sucker because uh, they, uh, they, they have a disc. They have a disc on their lower part, not on their front part, yeah. and then they suck onto things uh, oh, okay. to to what, guard their eggs. That's, that's and it, 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 it's a it's a really interesting species because it it uh, breeds all year round. Uh, so whenever you find it uh, spearfishing, you because you're normally in the fjords or in the coastal areas. If the fish is there, it's there to reproduce. So that means that it'll be full of eggs unless it's like sitting and guarding its eggs already, then you don't take it. But if you see it out swimming, then you know that it's full of eggs, so you take it. And this fish has 
um, probably uh, one third of its weight is just uh, eggs. So we make uh, caviar from it. Really good caviar. Ooh. And you can make it with vodka or you can make it with uh, brandy. Okay. And it's uh, fantastic. It's a, it's a little bit hard work, but it's, uh, it's worth it. It's amazing. Mm. Cool. When I when I was teaching scuba diving, there was uh, like uh, my uh, how do you say marker? Like you have a place yeah, that you remember? Yeah, like a, like in a marker for like the eighteen meter point was someone had thrown in a cement mixer, an orange cement mixer, and on the back of the cement mixer there was all this lump sucker. Okay. Like the cutest thing in the world. You have to Google it. I was going to say, you guys should make a video, um, you know, just about lump sucker hunting because it'll be intriguing and funny as hell. And there's a Red Hot Chili Peppers song from back in the day called No Chump Love Sucker. And uh, it, 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 it even rhymes. So you could do the Lump Sucker, No Chump Love Sucker remix. And uh, 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 you, you, you know what? I'll, I'll write that down and I'll, I'll, uh, down. I'll give you a shout out when it's yeah. up on YouTube. Uh, I'll make that. It'll be sick. It'll be fu- it'll be funny as hell because like none of us know what you're talking about, and the description of the fish alone is worthy of a video. So <laughs> yeah, uh, we, we have some, uh, I'm sitting on some really good footage of uh, lump suckers. So yeah, Ooh, definitely awesome. Yeah, yeah no chump lump suckers. Not, by red hot chili peppers mm. is a good one. <laughs> no chump lump. But they're not that easy to find. No, they're yeah. not that abundant, but but uh, they're not particularly hard to catch because they're no, not very. No. Uh, Good swimmers. That's <laughs> <laughs> the lump sucking. Hey noobers, it's uh, Jeremy here from Spearing Magazine with an uh, with an update for you guys. Shrek and Turbo have been doing such a great job with uh, telling guys about Spearing Magazine that we've actually sold out of most of our back issues and catalogs. But uh, I just wanted to let you guys know that uh, we have an international subscription available just for you guys. Yeah, from Spearing Magazine. I'm Jeremy Campbell. Thank you, guys. Go to SpearingMagazine.com. Check out the uh, international subscription. Aw, yeah. Spearo Log, an actual logbook for spearfishing. Yes, it's a paper form and perhaps we could go digital in the future. But at the moment, Spearolog is available right now on Amazon.com to capture your dives and help you replicate past results. Because if you're capturing that fish in those specific conditions and it doesn't happen every week, there's probably some unique variables that are allowing that phenomenon to take place. So record them in your dive log you can go back, you can have a look at data over time and you can see what works, what makes your spots and locations tick. Get Spiro Log on Amazon.com today. Spiro Log by Noob Spiro. Oh you, go, you guys seem pretty in tune with, you know, like your ecosystem around you, like the species and just some of the words you've dropped today. I know you both have the scuba diving background and it, it makes you probably self-educate a little bit more, but what are your kind of resources and what websites for learning about, you know, your local area? Yeah, uh, so uh, I'm, I'm actually studying marine resource management and I'm doing also a, a fisheries biology uh, thesis, which I'm working on now. So. Ah. So yeah. there's that, and then I also uh, our heart goes out to Ule, who's yeah. writing his master's thesis now. <laughs> and and uh, also uh, growing up, I would work in a fishmonger. I think I worked there for 15 years. Wow! Uh, so so I always just been really interested in it, and uh, that's also why I uh, why I'm doing uh, my my degrees and studies. So, so you're not just intrigued by the water; you're intrigued by marine life in general. Uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we we have a we, we we do everything we do is uh, connected with the ocean more or less. And now, you know, in the winter where it's not that much uh, fish for spare fishing, we uh, also for six years uh, the whales actually would come. Th- there were whales coming to uh, Tromsø just 15 minutes from our house in the winter. Wow. Uh, humpbacks and orcas, so we would go free diving with them for years. Oh wow! Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it was fantastic. 
Now the whales have moved uh, further, uh, further north. Further, yeah. yeah. Tell them about the herring, the herring, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, juvenile herring uh, movement. Yeah, you it, say? Uh, it, it's uh, it's uh, quite cool uh, the way they figure out where the whales are going to be the next years because uh, humpbacks and orcas they come up here uh, to hunt uh, to fatten up before. The they, before they go uh, breeding and all this stuff. Mm. So they follow uh, this uh, spring spawning uh, herring that mm. comes up uh, to the fjords of northern Norway mm. for uh, to overwinter. Okay. And, uh, and for the last six years they would come to uh, Tromsø. Uh, but rec in recent years, uh, so last year and the year before, uh, they would uh, go a little bit further north because uh, herring is uh, actually a long-lived species that can live up to 25 years. Oh, wow. uh, so now the stock uh, consists of more young herring. So they're kind of doing like a youth rebellion and saying, okay, now we've been, we've been to Trump's uh, for so many years, let's do something new. So uh, the majority of the stock goes further north and then everybody else follows, right? So... Yeah. So every few years there's a juvenile rebellion and this whole huge like tons of herring they go somewhere else and then okay. the whales follow them. I yeah. thought I thought so, you were going to suggest that it was a water temp change or something like that. So it's interesting that it's just a generational change and you know like more of a yeah, you know, it, like like a youth rebellion is a funny way to put it but um it's interesting. <laughs> how well managed is the fishery off 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 Norway? It's uh, Norwegians uh, praise and say that you know we have the uh, best management in the world. But in all fairness, it has a lot to do with uh, uh, biophysical luck and, and biological chance. You know, uh, just high good recruitment years of different species. But but uh, in in general, it's quite good. I, c I could uh, talk about fisheries management for. Uh, for the entirety of this podcast, but but it, but but it is pretty good. It's uh, it's entirely research based. Sorry, I was going to say I might have to get you back because um, I've had some uh, quite a few requests for more um, episodes on sustainability, and I've got a few guys. A few, I want to have a bit of a panel round robin and have a real good chat about fisheries management and. And how how sparrows can get more involved and just be a bit more aware about what's going on around them. So, we'll we'll have to get you back for some of that stuff, Ole. Yeah, absolutely. I'll be I'll be super stoked for that. And you can talk about your your, your PhD by then as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. I, I'm I'm stuck with my masters now. We'll see <laughs> PhD. No, no, no. PhD. Don't, don't sell yourself short. I said I'm rooting for Ole to get his PhD in Australia. Ah, okay. You want to you you want to be back in the warm climate, Gil? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you guys have definitely even got though something. it's so rich up here. Yeah, it's it's definitely a, a different sort of environment than a lot of sparrows are, list, uh, are used to. So, look, tell us about maybe a toughest situation you guys have had out on the water. What's what's something you've had out that's really scared you, and, and what'd you learn from it? Uh, I I I think. Uh... I think I'll I would have to go to the story where me and uh, me and my mate were out uh, we were out spearfishing uh, halibut I think it was uh, last year two year three years ago uh, anyway I, yeah it was three years ago so we we were experienced but we were still fairly new to halibut spearfishing uh, but we recently found a really good strait where we'd catch a lot of halibut that that season. And we took out my mate, my mate's uh, zodiac. So you know, like a rubber uh, a dinghy yep, kind of a rubber duck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, we we went out to this area. It's about an hour drive. We put the boat on the car. We put the boat in in the water with the car, and then it's about forty five minute drive with the boat. So I don't know, say eight kilometers maybe. And uh, we start spearfishing, and my mate starts uh, using the boat as a float line, and I'm using my normal float rig. Okay. And uh, 15 minutes in, uh, I hear him screaming, you know, like a, like a, like an injured dog. Yeah, Hollywood, Hollywood. 
<laughs> and uh, I, I rush up to him and uh, I, I see the white in his eyes. You know, he, he shot something big. He's, uh, up until this point, we caught halibut that were around 40 kilos, something like that. Um, so uh, we're, we're waiting for the fish to kind of calm down after the, fi- after the first shot. And we start swimming down. Uh, I was filming the whole thing, uh, and he was going to take the second shots. Luckily, we had, uh, I think, uh, we had four spear guns with us in total. <laughs> um, he, 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 got a, he got a decent first shot, but it's really hard to stone the fish. The brain is quite small, and uh, you, you want to shoot it in the head-neck area to get a good holding shot. Yeah, uh, but but it, he didn't stone it, and uh, so we were swimming down to get a second shot. I'm filming, and he's uh, shooting it. And I, I I started. I directly see that this is a huge fish. This is the biggest fish I've ever seen. <laughs> uh, so he takes the second shot. We're like, oh, holy shit, that's a big fish, big fish. We uh, take out the third gun. <laughs> same deal. Fourth gun. I, I believe we shot. It, he shot it four times, but. <laughs> so it, it, it's by that time you know it kind of feels like you're shooting a sack of potatoes it, it doesn't even react yeah. it feels redundant uh, but anyway you shoot it a lot of times and then he swims up with it to the surface and we're just super super stoked happy as can be and uh, we also uh, I also uh, by that time uh, I was getting up in the boat uh, and then he uh, bled the fish, you know, cutting the gills. So cutting between the heart and the gills, so it bleeds out. Yeah. And uh, I'm just standing there with a uh, with a shark, you know, those big shark hooks. Yeah. Uh, so I had that and a line. I put the shark hook through the underside of the jaw of the fish, and I'm standing there holding it, just waiting for it to kind of bleed out. And uh, I just standing there for about 15 minutes with the fish bleeding out making sure that it's uh not not giving us a fight once we have it up in the boat because it's a zodiac uh, rubber duck yeah yeah and uh, yeah the, the fish haven't done it made any movements nothing uh in 15 minutes i tell my mate to start taking the shafts out and it takes one shaft out fine and it starts pulling out the second shaft and the fish just start thrashing like absolutely like a monster, like nothing. I'm standing there holding it. I'm like, shit, 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 shit. <laughs> and it kind of spit. What happened was that. Up, hmm? and, up until then, the halibut thought you were giving it acupuncture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and you guys That's have but... spoiled the party with the knife and the, and the shaft coming out. And he's, he's finally got onto it. <laughs> this is good stuff it's probably thinking <laughs> no, con- con- considering the size of it it was uh, seven- 76 kilo fish oh wow mm, it was waiting for the happy ending yeah <laughs> so so uh, when I, he starts taking the needles out that's when the fish probably thought the acupuncture was uh, finished so he, yeah. <laughs> he starts thrashing you want to go home yeah and uh, I, th- I, I actually think the fish was more or less dead it's just uh kind of like neurological uh reflexes but a fish that size it has two types of muscles it's uh go up and down you know yeah right uh so so crazy movement and the fish spins around so now all of a sudden the shafts are facing me and the boat and one one of the shafts rips two out of uh three uh chambers on the zodiac And I'm just standing there, and, and we're <laughs> far out in a straight. It's not so far to land, so you know we won't we won't uh, drift out to sea or anything. But still, it's no roads, it's nothing. This is rural areas. It would uh, it would regardless the situation is rough. Yeah, uh, I'm like, what the f- what the shit do we do now? You know, my mates yeah. just. Trying to hold <laughs> hold some of the shafts, he's like, "We're gonna die! We're gonna die!" <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, he had, he had. You can see it in the video. He has total tunnel vision. Like the friend went full tunnel. 
He yeah. couldn't see anything. All he could do was hold on to the rope. Yeah, it, it was uh, quite ridiculous. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, okay, stay calm. What do we do? Okay, I, I take the lines uh, away from the engine. I, uh, actually, I, I tell my mate, okay, mate, 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 take all these lines away. I'm going to start the engine. We're going to start backing up uh, towards land. And my mate just, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I... Uh, getting ready to start the engine, I look at him and he's just looking at this fish, holding this fish. <laughs> he, he jumps up to the boat, holds the line, and he just focused on the fish. And I, <laughs> I, I, I swear to God, I, I, I thought I had to like do everything. He, he, yeah. So uh, uh, luckily, uh, after a couple of minutes of backing towards land, I see that it was another boat in the strait out fishing. Yeah. So I start uh, start whistling for this uh, this boat to come and, <laughs> and pretty much rescue us. Mm. Uh, so and there's a proper uh, northern Norwegian fishing fisherman guy. You know, look he look kind of look like the mountain from Game of Thrones. <laughs> uh, this big guy just comes yeah. up like, "What the hell are you guys doing here?" Like, uh, my yeah. mate's a Swede and I'm from the south, so. The northerners oh. really make fun of uh, both of our stereotypes. <laughs> There's yeah. no respect. No respect. No respect. It's yeah, just yeah. what the hell are you guys doing? But uh, he, he was arising. We caught a really big fish. He's like, okay, <laughs> you guys are right. <laughs> yeah. So so he he uh, kind of dra- dragged the boat, uh, towed towed us back to land where we. Uh, I knew a guy who had a cabin in the area where we took the boat up and yeah. But but we were we we were in the water for fifteen minutes, but the whole trip took about eight hours. <laughs> mm. Oh wow, wow! So do you think your mate like went into like a mild form of shock? What well, I mean, what why did why did the the tunnel vision close in so much? I mean, was it just a overreaction, or I mean, I can understand like it'd be a stressful situation, but like was it just too many crazy things happening at once? I think uh, I think he was uh, torn because I think in his mind he's like we either save the boat and ourselves or we save the fish, and he's like he couldn't make up his mind what was the bigger you know the victory of having the biggest fish that any one of us had ever caught, or like uh, to save him his life. <laughs> we have a healthy uh, healthy I'm game of sure, competition there. <laughs> like I know I, I'm pretty sure that's what it was. He couldn't make up his mind what was worth more. <laughs> oh, wow. that's a moral dilemma. It, so, so it was a luckily, zero end game. So luckily, I went into survival mode, and my mate went into uh, pride mode. <laughs> mm. But you did a, a, a zodiac safety course, didn't you? Or was yeah. that later? No, that was uh, just before, actually. Okay, but, yeah. yeah. So it's good. To, I think it's good that Ule had a, a safety course. He did it for his mas- his uh, bachelor or master. He had like a zodiac safety course, but I think it helps. I don't know. So do they do they teach you to drive with one chamber full and two flat? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I don't think any of the, any of his uh, courses helped me in this particular situation, but yeah, but, but yeah. maybe uh, just uh, you know trying to at least trying to think straight helps. I went out in a rubber duck uh, two weekends ago um, down here off the Gold Coast and uh, there were three guys and um, two of them were fairly experienced but they all ended up seriously seasick. Um, they they move a bit in the ocean and uh, so it ended up being I had three boaties and I was the only one spearing so not very safe. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Good time. <laughs> three guys, three guys vomiting, and I kept them in the boat for two or three hours, and it just made them suck it up. <laughs> oh, that's good because all of that puke really chums up the water for you. Oh, that's what I was thinking. I was like, bring in the pelagics. Come on, guys. <laughs> <laughs> what did you guys have for lunch? Burgers? Yeah, no, nah, they didn't have lunch, but uh, I had my typical oh. bag, bag of Doritos at halftime. But uh, no, no, it's all good. Oh. <laughs> Oh, good. Uh-huh. I, I got a couple more questions about 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 Norway. Um, what what is what are the water temps you're dealing with? So you said like the seven mil Elios is is getting the job done with the three finger gloves. What do you call them? Uh, I'm uh, mittens, I guess. Mittens, mittens. Uh, three three finger gloves. They're called. Uh, Doesn't yeah, sound very tough, um, though, does it? 
It doesn't sound very tough. You've got to come up with a better word than mittens. Yeah, <laughs> I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mittens. Uh, like, a, let, let's call them uh, Kevlar gloves. Oh, nice, nice, nice. <laughs> three, yeah. three, three finger uh, night Kevlar gloves. Oh, that's better. Three finger Kevlars. Yeah, yeah. I'm with you. Keep All right. Keep and, uh, <laughs> no, uh, and uh, yeah, because uh, uh, I'm quite lanky, so I. I really benefit from a uh, tailor-made. So, I I had a uh, Elias uh, tailor-made uh, for I think four seasons, and I know uh, some people uh, have issues with uh, the quality and tearing of uh, of tailor-made suits. But yeah. uh, once you have a good neoprene and elastic, but my my suit didn't tear. It tore uh, this this season. It tore on the knee because I had knee pads. Okay. Uh, ju- just because the it was so overused, I wore that wetsuit to bits. Yeah, but right. uh, no, I'm 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 getting a I'm getting a new one for next season, which is awesome. And uh, and for for uh, you you need uh, three finger Kevlar night uh, gloves. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm actually using a nine millimeter uh, socks uh, just because I got. I got really big uh, pockets for my... He's got really big feet. Yeah, so, you know, big feet, big socks. <laughs> know what they say about big feet. <clears throat> yeah, big, big socks. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Um, okay. okay, so we're sorted with our, with our clothing. We're staying warm. Um, what, what are the best times of the year for a visit over there, like for guys that are wanting to travel over? Uh, I, I think uh, if, if you're coming uh, from a warm country, I would recommend coming in uh, any time between uh, June, July, August. Uh, but then there are a possibility, especially in August, for uh, a little bit bad visibility because we have a there's you know how it's uh, spring blooms of uh, plankton uh, yep. up in uh, temperate waters. We, we we have one in the spring and one in the fall. Okay. So there's a couple of weeks in August normally where the visibility is also, but but it can come any time. It depends on uh, temperature and uh, and light. Uh, but okay, so uh, w- what about these temperatures? So what guys come in that June, so July, in, August yeah, period? What's, in, what's ordered? In the in the summer in Tromsø, in the inner fjords, it's uh, colder because you don't have so much shifting of the water. Okay. So you can have uh, temperatures down to six or seven degrees even in the summer, but uh, once you go a little bit further out, you normally have uh, around eleven degrees in the summer. Uh, Lovely. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, You'd be pulling your board <laughs> shorts out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Uh, mm. But uh, but now in the in the winter, everything is um, between six to zero degrees Celsius, depending where you're at. And, uh, you can fillet fish with your nipples. That's how cold it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but for people coming out, uh, the summer is the time. But but uh, for good visibility and if you can deal with the cold a little bit, I think uh, September and October is also really really good spare fishing. It's a really good balance between like good visibility. And uh, like the 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 fishing is uh, is amazing, and it is it is colder, but and there is less light. Yeah. But it's it's just uh, somehow a little bit better fishing. Yeah, but, but uh, if you come for halibut, of if course. you if you come uh, spare fishing halibut, you can find halibut in June, July. It's okay. uh, no problem. But yeah. I mean that's the reason most people come up here. And it's also the cool. Big one. In, in in summer you have a mid midnight. I love how pristine it looks. Like I was in um, Lake Baikal in Russia in June last year, and um, the water was like the water was like four degrees, but like it's just crystal clear and and the air is as well. And Norway seems like it's almost the same sort of deal. Like this is this the special sort of pristine cleanliness about you know not only the air but i guess the water as well i think i think it'd be remarkable just to go over and experience that 
Uh, yeah, I, th- is, I think yeah. it's quite quite unique. Uh, it is uh, pretty fantastic. It is it is very clean compared to many places I've been to. It, it's remarkably clean. But you have to think like there's not that many people living up here. There isn't so many like there isn't pollution. There's much less land pollution than you get anywhere else. And I think the temperature of the water also yeah, affects it helps. It, it helps as well with. Uh, you know, bacteria grows and things like that. So, yeah, it, it it's it really is gorgeous. But when you hunt for halibut, it's not like, I mean, are you it's like comparing uh, I don't know apples and oranges, right? Because it's not like a coral reef where it's so colorful and it's so it's uh, so many eye catching things. Yeah, like yeah. when you hunt for halibut, it's just it can be like a desert, you know. Oh, wow. It's just like rocks. Like we have some uh, cold water coral, it's like pink, but it's just like rocks, sand, rocks, sand, and then you have some sand, and then you got some rocks, <laughs> and then you start like like seeing halibut that aren't there. You know what I mean? <laughs> when you're looking yeah. for something, and it's like it's like sunspots where you're like, the- oh, that rock, that giant rock. Like I've seen uh, when you look at a huge rock, right? It's it's like it couldn't possibly be a fish, and you're like, oh, that's like a 500 kilo halibut. I'm going to spear the biggest fish anyone has ever heard of. <laughs> so like, um, but, so so when you go halibut chasing, I mean, I mean, let's talk a little bit. What do they eat? What do they predate upon? What's their main food source? Uh, it's a, uh, it's hard to say. They they're they're top predators, right? And they're mainly pelagic hunters. Uh, but we find all sorts of things in their stomachs. Uh, anything from uh, these lump suckers that we were talking about yep, to yep. crab, crustaceans, uh, other flat fish, pelagic fish. They eat everything. They eat halibut. Oh, they eat halibut. Eat halibut. Yeah. Oh, wow. uh, so <laughs> they're they're definitely uh, the top predator around here. Once they grow a little bit bigger. Okay, and how, how do they behave? Like, do they like tidal movement? Do they, will, will you find them in, um, in water that's moving? What, what kind of depths um, do you find them in during, like, tidal phases and things like that? What's your kind of methodology? So, so uh, the, it's kind of like, uh, like, wasn't it Einstein that said uh, the, the, the more I learn, the less I know? Yeah. Or something yeah. like that. Maybe. Yeah. So uh, it's kind of like that with halibut. Uh, the, the, you can find halibut anywhere we found. We go out sometimes and we see a certain type of bottom substrate, be it a little bit coralline, algae, corals, like uh, broken up uh, shells, sand, this kind of uh, a mixed, uh, mi- mixed desert uh, bottom substrate. Like, oh, wow, this is a really hot area. This, it's definitely halibut here. And then we don't find anything, right? And then all of a sudden we're swimming in an area and uh, we say, no, this place is useless, let's go back. You know, just one last dive and then you see a huge fish, you know. <laughs> yeah, like all of a sudden you're in an area with lots of rocks and kelp, like big rocks. Like, uh, yeah. and like then, bedrock. Hmm? Bedrock. Like bedrock and kelp and stuff. And then all of a sudden it's halibut everywhere. Yeah, yeah. so, so yeah. M- most... Most of the time you see them uh, just laying down, uh, mm. chilling, but uh, sometimes you see actually see them out swimming and uh, they're swimming on the bottom, but, uh, w- which is the most fun, fun way to find <laughs> them, but because you see a swimming fish and you gotta kind of gotta swim, lure it to, or stalk it somehow. Mm. One time... Uh... One time I saw a halibut uh, free swimming, like in the water, hunting in the, in the blue. And that was amazing. It's so beautiful. Because mm-hmm. yeah, uh, people who fish halibut with a uh, rod and lure uh, say that they, they normally bite when they're in the water column quite high up. Ah, okay. So maybe they're feeding so when they're free swimming, like rather than like yeah, resting yeah, yeah. Or, or doing ambush or something when they're on the bottom. Absolutely. But they also eat urchins, right? Uh, not so uh, much. No, no, that's the, yeah, sorry, oh. that's a wolfish. Delete. <laughs> Delete again. <laughs> <laughs> that's so good. That's so good. Um, 
<laughs> I, I did a podcast on a guy called Fish Nerds show one day and he did a fish quiz with me. It was embarrassing. I think I got z- one from five right out of the questions he asked me. But anyway, and I, and I have a spearfishing show. So don't, don't be afraid of what you don't know. It's all good. Um, good. good thing the, you can edit it. <laughs> what's the best um, or the biggest or the most exciting uh, halibut you've taken, Gil? Uh, well, there was the, like our, the fish of a lifetime, which was, uh, well, I didn't take it, but, uh, I got a pretty nice fish. The last time we went out, it was 15 kilo. Yeah. 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 And, uh, I was pretty proud of that. I mean, uh, I mean the, the day, the weekend before that, Ule got 130 kilo halibut. Uh, well that always makes you feel bad. Comparison's terrible for that. Yeah, comparison is terrible. But there's a lot of comparison in the spearfishing game. I mean, you can't deny it. Yeah, no, 100%. But, but like, I'll talk to guys sometimes, and the biggest fish they shot is not necessarily the, the most exciting fish that they have taken. You know, like, there was maybe not much of a stalk involved or whatever. So sometimes the the smaller fish are the more memorable ones, maybe, and your first ones always sometimes more memorable than your biggest ones. So, um, yeah. so your 15 kilo one... Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was very nice. It was. Uh, it wasn't. It didn't give me much of a fight. I was just. Uh, you know how the fish is always there when you're getting back on the boat. You're like, oh, let's go again. Let's do the. <laughs> let's do the drift again. And then you look down and it's just there. So <laughs> yeah. it was just there. <laughs> okay, so you, you know just you have to parked up on the bottom. <laughs> yeah, it was swimming. Oh, and okay. I'm like, I was going to get back on the boat and it was like swimming along the bottom, very chill. And I'm like getting back on the boat and I already handed up my gun to Ule, who was Bodhi at the time. And I'm like, Ule, give me my gun. And then uh, the fish was free swimming. So I started chasing it and then it just stopped. And I'm like, OK, so I guess you were Bang. meant to be. And uh, okay. it was delicious. Yeah, yeah, I bet it was. I yeah. bet it was. And, uh, hmm. But I really enjoy it, like when uh, when people I've never that's like my biggest fish, and I don't mind getting smaller fish because, uh, of course not. But uh, it's nice when we're out and uh, there's like a group effort. It, it's always a group effort. Yeah. Like so, when someone gets uh, when we were out and one of our friends got an, the 80 kilo halibut and Ole got the 130 kilo halibut and besides. That one, I spotted four halibut that day, and like uh, I spotted a total of five halibut that day, and four of them were like over 50 kilo. It was amazing. Oh, wow. It was wow. like the craziest day ever, and it was uh, it was like a, it was like a redemption. It was a day of failure and redemption. It was uh, we all failed. We got missed shots. I scared away fish. You know, <laughs> it was like it was like um, a beautiful shit show. You know, and then, you know, a gorgeous shit show. And then it was uh, in and then in the end, like we got uh, Ule got this epic fish and it was amazing. So even though it wasn't me that killed it, but I did get a fantastic lump sucker that day. And that always puts me in a good mood. <laughs> I was going to say, well, I'll, I'll ask um, Ole about his story in a sec. But um, one thing, when Rachel told me about you guys, she sent me a video of you guys. And I love the energy that you have. Like there is definitely a team dynamic. Everyone's grinning. The stoke factor's high. That's the kind of spearfishing trip I love to go out on. And uh, regardless what fish you catch, if you're out with good people that know how to have a laugh, you have a good time. And uh, so that was really cool. And I'll link that video up in today's show notes for guys to come and have a look. But tell us about this 130 kilo behemoth. What happened there, Ole? Yeah, so so, uh, as you mentioned, the stoke is always uh, real when it comes to halibut spearfishing. Because in general, you, you... you go out and you don't really expect to get a fish. You go out with your mates and you're on the boat and it's just a beautiful day to be in the water. Uh, when when you catch halibut, it's just a bonus. And uh, I think the stoke is also... Oh, shit. <laughs> 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 sorry, sorry. You go faster, All right, man. all right, I'll take it. No, but... but, but <laughs> It, it it really is uh, it really is uh, it, it drives you to uh, to the point of uh, 
of insanity because you you can be out for hours hours at end and just looking at really uh, desolate bottoms and sometimes you know you dive to 15 meters you dive to 10 meters uh, and sometimes you're just looking uh, at the bottom from the surface whatever it is you get really tired and once you see a halibut uh, either if you see it from the surface or if you see it while diving time just completely stops and it's just you and the fish and uh, you know your heart heart rate goes I don't know if it goes up if it goes down everything stops nothing else matters and to me the scariest part is when you see a fish from the surface which we did with this uh, 130 kilo fish because uh, they're quite easy to spook, uh, Holly, but they can uh, they can rush off at any second. So the the seconds uh, the seconds between uh, taking a duck dive and pulling the trigger is uh, eternity. Um, but uh, with with the, this big fish, it was a really really uh, clear clear water day. Gil actually spotted the fish. Because uh, right. she she <laughs> just spooked. Yeah, I she, spooked a big fish. She just spooked a really big fish, and that's she, what I mean by like uh, failure and redemption. It yeah, was, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. We spooked a lot of fish, and uh, I was so ready to give up. I was like <laughs> crying almost, and Ula's like, "You know what? I'm gonna come with you. We're gonna find this fish together." <laughs> yeah, and and uh, just as I said those words, and Gil's just. <laughs> and it took me a second before I spotted it, and then I saw it. And I'm like, "Holy shit, that's a big fish!" But, but I didn't think it was much bigger than, say, 60, 70 kilos, because the visibility was so good. And I thought maybe the water were four meters, six. I don't know. Not not as deep as it was. So once I started uh, diving down towards the fish, I realized it's a lot deeper. So I keep, kept swimming and swimming, and I probably shot it from a little bit far away. Uh, but I shot it, and I got a good holding shot. And the fish just rushed really, really, really fast. And it's crazy when you see like a barn door, uh, as you call it, swimming yeah. away uh, at crazy speeds. Uh, but but uh, luckily it stopped not, not too far away and uh, my mate uh, took a good second shot and uh, then I got a good uh, good stoning uh, third shot so uh, yeah. and we we were just absolutely in shock when we mm-hmm. got that fish off the boat because it's only then that you realize how big these things are. We had to we had to counterweight it so <laughs> it was like. It had a. It was a roped around the tail, and then we. There was someone on the other side of the boat in the water holding it, holding okay. the other side of the rope, so that we could get it on in the. In Leaning the, over towards. Like, the yeah. Other side. Right. It was amazing, and it was uh, the end of it. It was the, it was like the last dive of the last dive, and it was already getting dark because it gets dark quite early, and it was so beautiful. It was amazing. Yeah, no, uh, the whole I, sky was pink. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you could see from these videos how how excited we get. I, I heard a lot of people saying how important it is to stay calm and like and stay focused and all these things when you're spearfishing. But uh, when you're spearfishing this uh, majestic fish, it's for me it's impossible. We 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 uh, we spill our guts, you know. It's that fulfillment of a of a big long hunt, like. And the and plans come to fruition. It can be, can be months, can be years of planning and in the, in the making and working your ass off through, you know, a lot of barren ground like you were talking about. I think you said desolate bottoms. I think maybe that's a good title title for the episode. Um, lump suckers and desolate bottoms. But uh, <laughs> but but seriously, I, I you can definitely feel that that you know the the stoke of a hunt fulfilled and. Uh, <laughs> It comes through loud and clear. I'll definitely link up that bit in the show notes. And um, what's the world record for halibut? Uh, so now the there there was a new uh, management uh, 
regulation uh, that came in 2017 is that you're not allowed to uh, land halibut over two meters. Uh, th uh, it's not a uh, uh, um, uh, stock, um, unfortunately. Yeah, because uh, halibut they grow quite old and quite big, so they accumulate quite a bit of ah, okay. uh, uh, of heavy metals and pollutants when they're that big. So th that's the reasoning uh, for it's not that they're great spawners, which they okay. also are, but the stock is uh, doing quite well up here. Uh, so so the world record, I believe, I think it's uh, Lithuanian guys, they, they spared, uh, I think it was 159 kilos. Uh, but that was before the regulation. Yeah, yeah. so, so n now the, the 130 kilo fish that we caught, we measured it to be a 199, and then when we anything between two and 199, which was mm. just by random, because as I said, I thought it was a lot smaller. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but but that's like the top legal limit. <laughs> so seeing as it's the top legal limit now, <laughs> I think we have the record. <laughs> to be perfectly honest, I'm just saying I don't want to toot my horn or anything. But good good team effort. And so when you guys. When you guys see a halibut, you do this ridiculous call. Can you do it for me now? Is that we do you, what? You do like a call when you see one. Is that right? <laughs> you call? make it. You make yeah. a sound. Kvaita! <laughs> Kvaita! <laughs> Should yeah. we do it together? Yeah. Three. Yeah. Three, two, <laughs> okay, one. one. <laughs> Kvaita! <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> Yeah, and that's the that's the call of the halibut. That, that's that's the that's the stock. Yeah, it's uh, if you look at we were talking about Daniel Mann's movie. It's the equivalent of halibut. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. yeah cool. Awesome. Guys, head over to vimeo.com. Check out the How to Spearfish video series by Luke Potts. There's nearly four hours of video training there, and they're divided into five different videos so far to help you take on the areas of difficulty that you might have. Now, there's a beginner's guide to spearfishing gear. There's a guide to how to increase your breath hold for spearfishing. There's techniques for spearfishing yellowtail kingfish, which also doubles as a guide to hunting pelagic fish. There's a, a guide techniques for spearfishing snapper, which is a really good, um, helpful guide for approaching canny reef fish, which is a tough one. And finally, a guide to spearfishing around sharks. If you want to buy any of these videos, use the code NoobSpero and save a bit of cash. Check it out. Vimeo On Demand, How to Spearfish. All right, we're going to do a fast around Spiro Q&A, and then I'm going to find out where guys can get hold of you guys. So, look, um, maybe you guys can yeah. answer these one at a time. Gil, what is the single yeah. best yes. piece of advice you've ever been given uh, for me? spearfishing? Or, or, yeah, you go. Mm. The single best piece mm. of advice? Oh, I thought about this. Uh, come back to me. Come back to me. We'll, oh. we'll go first. <laughs> all right. All right. Uh, I panic. <laughs> <laughs> best advice, uh, spearfishing, get... Three finger gloves, I think, is the best. Or Crocs. <laughs> mm. Three finger. You look good, and you uh, you look good, and you save your socks. <laughs> mm. yeah. I think uh, for me, uh, ankle weights was really good. Ooh, nice. What I was like, get some ankle weights, and I got ankle weights, and I love it. How much are you wearing, and what brand are you wearing? What brand ankle weights? I don't remember the cheapest one I could order. <laughs> yeah, I think it's uh, immersion ones. Uh, the, the thing about ankle weights, uh, also, uh, it's really good to have uh, evenly distributed weights because you're having seven millimeter suits, so you need uh, anything between seven to nine kilos, depending. So uh, I also use ankle weights and uh, also use a dive vest to distribute it. I used to be, uh, I used to suffer uh, from uh, back pain from a big, uh, big weight belt, but. Mm. Okay, so I think uh, when I was beginning to when I was be, when I was making the transition mm. from uh, from scuba diver to a uh, free diver, then I would like without noticing I would always keep my snorkel in, and Ula is like, "What are you doing?" And I'm like, "Oh shit!" And then when I train myself, of course, you know, obviously you need to take the snorkel out. It actually makes a huge difference, you know. 
Uh, so that was really good advice. Yeah, cool, cool. Way back then. Like you, you said evenly distributed mm -hmm. with your weight. So you've got seven or nine kilo. You've got a vest, a belt, and ankle weights on. How how much are you wearing? Where uh, I have uh, three kilos in uh, three kilos in my uh, vest, three on my belt, and uh, one uh, or a half a kilo on each leg. So I, I dive with seven kilos. Okay. And what about you, Gil? I dive with eight kilo. So I will have like one kilo on each leg and six around my waist. Ah, okay. So girls. Girls have to wear more weight, you reckon? Is that your theory? Well, <laughs> Isaac. It, it seems <laughs> to be incredibly <laughs> like different. Like you can get two people the same size and they wear a different amount of weight. I mean, there's lung capacity, but there's also composition as well. It's a it's a funny it's a funny thing waiting. Yeah, I mean, I'm a one meter like uh, sixty seven, and Ula is almost two meters tall, and I wear a seven millimeter suit. But I'm uh, I'm very buoyant. What can I say? I, I need more weight to keep me down. <laughs> all right. Um, next question. If you had to start all over again, what would you do differently? I, I, I would uh, look more into uh, YouTube and uh, other learning things. Uh, there's this good yeah. podcast I've heard about. <laughs> mm. uh, no, but uh, t talk to more experienced people and... Uh, not really going to this uh, pits that we <laughs> kind of fell into. I would, um, yeah, so I, I would have started spear fishing earlier because I held out for a while, uh, but I would have started earlier. And I think we would, we have, we mm. agreed that we would have started going out on boats much sooner. Like yeah. uh, we were so, uh, it, it's like a, a pleasure when you're used to uh, going and uh, scuba diving. You go out on yeah, boats yeah. so much, suddenly it becomes a pleasure to go shore diving. And so we, we enjoyed going shore diving so much that we, we, we almost didn't think about taking a boat. And then we just one day were like, let's rent a <laughs> fucking boat. Yeah. And our life has never been the same. Yeah, cool. Yeah. All mm -hmm. right, uh, Ole, loaded question. Uh, who is the best person to go spearfishing with and why? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I think... Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, well, uh, I have a knife to my throat, so... To your, <laughs> no, no. To your throat. No, but uh, uh, I, yeah. the, the, the best person to have is, uh, especially when you're on the boat, is somebody that will either tell you what to do and everybody follow that, or a person that listens to what you say when you're kind, kind of captain, not really, but... But uh, somebody that takes uh, safety very seriously and... Uh, Obviously, it's always good to have people that you can have a good laugh with because it can be so miserable being out of spearfishing area. It's really good to have uh, somebody that's a good laugh and uh, yeah. can mess about. It just likes putting like cod shit all over themselves to keep everyone else amused. <laughs> yeah, you have to have you have to keep your spirits up. We have a few tricks for keeping the spirits okay. up. Come on, hmm. what are they? Well, one of them is chocolate. Okay. <laughs> You have to have some chocolate. And also we like to, we sing. If, if you like, especially, and I think it's like a rain dance. When you dance and then the rain falls, we sing to bring the fish to find the halibut. And it works every once in a while. <laughs> you just sing whatever song you can think of. And you replace uh, lo like love or hate or whatever with halibut. <laughs> <laughs> so... And it and it works with almost every song. Oh, awesome. There's always music involved in a good spearfishing trip, but something every good boat should have is a good good sound system. I love it. Um, to drown out mostly mostly to drown out my singing, but yeah. Hey, um, absolutely awesome chatting with you guys today. Um, where can people come and find you? Maybe chat with you if they are interested in doing a Norway spearfishing adventure. Maybe ch chasing a barn door of their own. Yeah, you can find us uh, on uh, okay. Facebook. Instagram, YouTube, under Arctic Spearfishing. Uh, you can send a direct message there, or uh, also uh, there's an email. I don't remember. I think it's Arctic Spearfishing with a dot in between that Gmail. I'll I'll give you give it to you. you can give it in the show notes. <laughs> yeah, man. I'll put it in the show notes. I'll put in a whole lot of photos. Your YouTube, your Instagram, your Facebook, Arctic Spearfishing. We're all over it. And uh, maybe the, some of these videos we chatted about today uh, with some of these big heli, but that'll be cool as. Any, any, anything else? Parting advice for our for our rabid in, um, audience of Spiros. Oh, uh, we have we have a, be a piece of oh, yeah. parting advice. Yes, 
Oh, yeah. It's, uh, it's a Norwegian tradition. It's called Ole knows how to pronounce it. I'm still bad with my Norwegian pronunciation. Oh, yeah, you need a good hall. 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 Can, you, hall. can you say it, Isaac? One more. Hall. 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 Yeah, it's... Uh, you have to use the, the tongue on the back <laughs> of your throat. Uh, so, yeah, uh, that's the best, actually, trick going back to the best uh, tip you can get for spearfishing. It's, it's a Norwegian myth that when the fishermen went out fishing, they would get hull <laughs> from their wives the night before. So that's, uh, you need to have a good time before you go out spearfishing. Uh, like the banana myth and all that <laughs> stuff, it's, it's overruled by hull. So if you have a good time the day before, that's, that's the best uh, yeah. fishing luck you can get. Yeah, so you got to get good fishing luck. We've tried it many different ways. <laughs> <laughs> and the important thing is... Uh, Many different ways for many different fish, and the most important thing is to have a good time, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love it. You guys have been a barrel of laughs to chat to, and uh, I really enjoyed myself. And um, we'll definitely have to get 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 you guys back to chat again, um, particularly uh, with that sustainability episode. I'm eyeing up for the future, but yeah, awesome, awesome. Uh, so, guys, can come and follow Arctic Spearfishing, but mad chat today, guys, awesome, awesome. Thanks, very nice chatting with you, mate. Gil and Ole did not disappoint. That was one hell of an interview and uh, good yarns with those two. They forgot a hell of a lot of stuff that they wanted to mention during the show because we just got lost in having a good yarn. But uh, one of the tips they mentioned was always towel rope the halibut and it'll give some faint indications when you're about to spook it. I think the the other big advantage of towel roping a halibut is getting these big fish back up onto the boat and uh, it's certainly handy if you've got a guy like Turbo in there who actually has got some decent knot skills and uh, you know can help you get this rope around a fish and then leverage it back up onto the boat. It's definitely a handy skill to have when you start getting fish over like 50 kilo or 100 odd pound. So yeah, look, you can follow Gil and Ole on Arctic Spearfishing, Arctic Spearfishing on Instagram or Facebook. They uh, would be, they would be stoked to hear what you thought of their their episode. And um, we're gonna have to get them back because we missed out on a ton of their stories by the sounds of it. There's humpback stories and best stalks and all sorts of stuff. So yeah, absolute pair of champions at Arctic Spearfishing. So I love that. Not sure where we're off to in a fortnight, but um, as usual, if you love the show, leave a review. It's always welcome. And I'd also ask, um, if you really love the show and you've been listening for a while, consider coming on Patreon and becoming a patron. There's three different levels you can get on, and there'll be some special bonuses coming up and all sorts of things. Um, One of the things we could do is our patrons, when they recommend guests, are the people we chase the hardest. And um, so, yeah, hey, love it. See you in a fortnight. Shrek out. Today's Noob Spiro podcast is brought to you by patrons just like you. If you enjoy the show, love it if you came over to patreon.com and support the Noob Spiro podcast. Basically, Patreon is a membership platform that makes it easy for artists and creators to get paid. And we have a Noob Spiro Patreon. Basically, there's three levels that you can support us at. $2 an episode, $5 an episode, or $10 an episode and you'll get some unique benefits. You're gonna get early access to content. Uh, You're gonna get first choice, first recommendations for guests in the future. And occasionally for some patrons, we're even just gonna give you a call and catch up with you. But uh, it'd be great if you could get on patreon.com forward slash noobspiro, come and support us. Now, I don't know about you, but I love new gear and spearfishing.com.au have got a huge range, mad flat shipping rate, especially in Australia. And if you use the code Noob Spiro, you not only support us, but you get $20 off every purchase over $200. That's right, pump in the code Noob Spiro at checkout, N-O-O-B-S-P-E-A-R-O at spearfishing.com.au and you will save 20 bucks on every purchase over $200. No brainer, thanks Adreno.